Great Plays. The National Broadcasting Company presents Great Plays, a series of famous plays selected to show the development of drama from the sunrise performances in ancient Athens down to the contemporary theater. We are privileged to have with us Mr. Burns Mantle, outstanding American drama critic and known throughout the country for his yearly volume of Broadway's Best Plays. He will act as commentator at today's production of Life is a Dream. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mantle. Well, my fellow playgoers, our great play travelogue has brought us again to Spain. Last week we were in Spain by proxy, as it were. The French Corneille's The Cid was an adaptation of a Spanish drama. But today we are going to hear a real Spanish drama written by Pedro Calderon de la Barca, who was accepted as a prince of dramatists by his enthusiastic countrymen and as the Spanish Shakespeare by no less a critic than the German Schlegel. He was a prolific disciple of the supremely prolific Lope de Vega, who dominated the Spanish theater for many years. But while de Vega wrote 1,500 plays, Calderon never got much above 200, and many of these were short religious sketches. Calderon was born in Madrid in 1600, was the son of a noble family, an honor student at a Jesuit college, and an eager writer of plays in his early teens. He suffered none of the discouragements of less favored playwrights. He was held in high esteem by his king, Philip IV, who made him the port laureate of Spain, and he was a favorite contributor to court entertainment. Calderon was a lyric poet of first quality, and though he was also a great, a great one for melodramatic plots, like Shakespeare, he clothed his most horrific situations in lovely verse. He was much concerned, as were all the Spanish writers of his time, with the basic emotions of love, hate, fear, pride, Envy, and above all, with the honor of Castile and the honor of all her noble sons. Calderon was also a good, good soldier. When his admirer and patron, the expansive King Philip, offered to let him off military service in Caledonia, if he would write a new play for the court, Calderon declined that easy assignment. He wrote the drama first, and then he went to war with his old command. When he was 52, he took holy orders and was a militant churchman until he died when he was 81. We are fortunate today, I think, in having a version of Life as a Dream adapted by Ernest Boyd from a translation made by Edward Fitzgerald, the English poet and translator of the Rubiat of Omer Khayyam. Life as a Dream tells the story of King Basilio of Poland, who, being something of an astrologer, cast the horoscope of his infant son and decided that he was to grow into a dangerous rival for the throne of Poland. Basilio, not to be outwitted, has Segismund, the son, cast into a dungeon and there guarded until he grows to manhood. The opening scene of the play is the Rocky Mountain barrier separating Poland and Russia, or Muscovy, as Russia was then called. It is late at night. A storm rages. Make, making their way tortuously across the mountains are the Lady Rosara disguised as a man, and her attendant, Fife. The Lady Rosara is invading Poland on a private revenge affair of her own. When we meet them, they have halted in the mountains to take note of their surroundings. Their horses, being frightened by the storm, have broken their tethers and run away. Lady Rosara and Fife are seeking shelter among the rocks. The Lady Rosara speaks. This is the gate that left me into Poland. And sorry welcomes as she jibes a guest who writes his own arrival on her rocks in his own blood. Yet better on her stony threshold die than live on unrevenged in Moscovy. Oh, what a soul some women have. I, I mean, some men. Oh, Fife. Fife, as you love me, Fife, make yourself perfect in that little part or all will go to ruin. Oh, I will. Please God we find someone to try it on. But truly... Would not anyone believe some fairy had exchanged us as we lay, two tiny foster children in one cradle? <laughs> well, be that as it may, Fife. It reminds me of what perhaps I should have thought before. But better late than never. You know I love you, as you I know love me, and loyally have followed me thus far in my wild venture. Well, now then, having seen me safe thus far, safe if not wholly sound... Over the rocks into the country where my business lies. Why should you not return the way we came? The storm all cleared away. And leaving me, find your way back to dear old home again. While I... Oh, come, come. 
heart, weeping, my poor fellow. Leave you here alone, my lady? Uh, Lord, I mean my lord, in a strange country among savages. Oh, now I know you. You would be rid of me for fear my stumbling speech. Oh, no, no, no. I want you with me for a thousand sakes to which that is is nothing. I myself more apt to let the secret out myself without your help at all. Come will, come woe, let it be that. For we will never part until you give the signal. Mm, Tis a bargain. (laughs) Poland is no great country. And as rich in men and means, will but few acres spare to lie beneath her barrier mountains here. We cannot, I believe, be very far from mankind or their dwellings. Oh, look. Look. Unless my fancy misconceived was twilight. Down among the rocks there, Fife. Some human dwelling, surely. Or think you but a rock torn from the rocks in some convulsion like today's and perched quaintly among them in mock masonry? Most likely that, I doubt. Oh, no, no. Oh, look, a square of darkness opening in it. Oh, I don't half like such openings. Like the loom of night from which she spins her outer gloom. Lord, uh, madam, pray forbear this tragic vein in, in such a time and place. And now again, within that square of darkness, look, a light. Feels its way with hesitating pulse as we do through the darkness that it drives to blacken into deeper night beyond. Hark! A, ch- a chain. And our lamp. A lamp. And now the hand that carries it. Oh, Lord, that, that, that dreadful chain. And now the bearer of the lamp. Indeed, as strange as any in Arabian tale. So giant like and terrible. And grand, spite of the skin he's wrapped in. Why? Tis his own. Or tis some wild man of the woods. I've heard they build and carry torches. And... Never ape bore such a brow before the heavens as that. Chain, as you say, too. Oh, that dreadful chain. And now he sets the lamp down by his side. And with one hand clenched in his tangled oh. hair. And with a sigh as if his heart would break. Listen. Once more the storm has roared itself away. Spitting the crags of God as it retires. But sparing still what it should only blast. This guilty piece of human handiwork and all that are within it. Oh, how oft. How oft within or here abroad have I waited. And in the whisper of my heart. Prayed for the slanting hand of heaven to strike the blow myself I dared not. Out of fear of that hereafter. Worse they say than here. What greater sorrow have you gazed upon than down this narrow chink you witness still? And now see, starting to his feet, he strides about uh, far as his tethered steps. What mystery is this? Why, the man's mad. That's all the mystery. That's why he's chained. And why he's... Hush. But then, if murder be the law by which not only conscience blind creatures, but man too prospers with his kind... Who, leaving all his guilty fellows free, abused their liberty to murder mine, and sworn to silence like their masters, mute in heaven, and like them twirling through the mask of darkness, answering to all I ask, point up to them whose work they execute. Even as I thought, some poor, unhappy wretch, a man wronged, wretched, unrevenged as I, nay, so much worse than I am. As by those chains clipped of a means of self-revenge on those who lay on him what they deserve. Poor soul. Poor soul. Speak lower. He will hear you. And if he should, what then? He could not harm me. Nay, and if he could, methinks I'd venture something of a life I care so little for. Who's that? Clotaldo? Who are you, I say, that venturing in these forbidden rocks... Have lighted on my miserable life and your own death. You would not hurt me, surely. Not I. But those that iron as the chain which they slay me with a lingering death will slay you with a sudden. Who are you? A stranger from across the mountain there, who having lost his way in this strange land in coming night, drew hither to what seemed a human dwelling hidden in these rocks. And where the voice of human sorrow soon told him it was so. Aye, but nearer, nearer, that by this smoky supplement of day, but for a moment I may see who speaks so pitifully sweet. Take care, take care. Alas, poor man, 
that I myself so helpless could better help you than by barren pity in my poor presence. Oh, think. If you who move about at will and live in sweet communion with your kind after an hour lost in these lonely rocks, hunger and thirst after some human voice to drink and human face to feed upon, what must one do where all is mute or harsh? And even the naked face of cruelty were better than a mask it works beneath. Across the mountain there. Across the mountain. What if the next world which they tell one of be only next across the mountain there? Though I must never see it till I die. And you, one of its angels. Alas, alas, no angel. But why and who they are who do and make you suffer? Hark. Of the watch to shut us in. Oh, should they find you here? Quick, behind the rocks. Here comes Clotaldo. Take my sword. These stormy days you like to see the last of, but ill opiates, Sigismund, I think, for night to follow. Tonight you see more than your wont disordered. What? A sword? Within there! <laughs> Whosoever watch this was will have to pay head reckoning. Meanwhile, this weapon has a wearer. Bring him here! Get him alive! There are two of them. Who are you that in defiance of known proclamation are found at nightfall too about this place? Oh, my lord. She? Uh, I, I mean he? Well, in fight, I... and let me speak. We are two foreign men to whom your country and its proclamations are equally unknown. And had we known, ourselves not masters of our lawless beasts that, terrified by the storm among your rocks, flung us upon them to our cost. Foreigners? Of what country? Muscovy. And with a bound? Hither, if this be Poland, but with no ill design on her, and therefore are taking it ill that we should thus be stopped upon her threshold so uncivilly. Whither in Poland? To the capital. On what errand? Set me on the road, and you shall be the nearer to my answer. So resolute and ready to reply, yet so young and... Well, your business was not surely with the man we found you with. He was the first we saw. And strangers and benighted as we were, as you too would have done in a light case, accosted him at once. Aye, but this sword... I threw it toward him. Well, and why? And why? But to revenge himself on those who thus injuriously misused him. So. 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 Well, I must take you both. You and your sword. Prisoners. How came you by this weapon? From my father. And you know whence he? Oh, very well. From one of this same Polish realm of yours, who promised a return should come the chance of courtesies that he received himself in Muscovy and left this pledge of it. Not likely yet it seemed to be redeemed. Oh, wondrous chance. Oh, wondrous providence. The sword that I myself in Muscovy, when these white hairs were black... For keepsake left of obligation for a like return to him who saved me, wounded as I lay, fighting against his country. Took me home, tended me like a brother till recovered. Well, a strange turn of fortune has arrested the sharp and sudden penalty that else had visited your rashness or mischance. And caused me to the very point you aim at. The capital? That capital of capitals, the court. Where you may plead and I may promise, win pardon for this, you say unwilling trespass. And prosecute what else you have at heart, with me to help you forward all I can, provided all in loyalty to those to whom by natural allegiance I first am bound to. As you make, I take your offer, with like promise on my side of loyalty to you and those you serve. Your hand. A bargain on both sides. Meanwhile, here shall you rest tonight. The break of day shall see us both together on the way. Thus, then, what I for misadventure blamed directly draws me where my wish is aimed. Rosara leaves that mysterious stranger so cruelly held in bondage and goes on to Warsaw, where King Basilio holds his court. Here at a reception, Astolfo, Duke of Muscovy, and nephew of Basilio, is paying his respects to Princess Estrella, a niece of Basilio. Both Astolfo and Estrella are contenders to the throne which lacks an heir. We are in the palace at Warsaw as Astolfo with his train and Estrella with hers enter the throne room. 
my royal cousin, if so near in blood, till this auspicious meeting scarcely known, till all that beauty promised in the bud is now to its consummate blossom blown. Well met at last, and may... Enough, my lord, of compliment devised for you by some court tailor. And believe me, still too short to cover the designful heart below. Indeed, indeed, you wrong me, royal cousin, and fair as royal. Misinterpreting what, even for the end you think I aim at, if false to you, were fatal to myself. Why, what else means the glittering steel, my lord, that bristles in the rear of these fine words? What can it mean but failing to cajole, to fight or force me from my just pretension? Nay, my knight, I not ask even you the same, the nodding helmets of whose men-at-arms outcrest the plumage of your lady court? But to defend what yours would force from me. You know that good King Basilio, deep in abstruser studies than this world, and busier with the stars than ladies' eyes, has never by a second marriage yet replaced, as Poland asked of him, the heir an early marriage brought and took away his young queen dying with the son she bore him, and in such alienation grown so old as leaves no other hope of heir to Poland than his two sisters' children, you, fair cousin, and me, for whom the commons of the realm divide themselves into two several factions, whether for you, the elder sister's child, or me, born of the younger, but they say, my natural prerogative of man, outweighing your priority of birth, which discord, growing loud and dangerous, our uncle, King Basilio, doubly sage in prophesying and providing for the future as to deal with it when it comes, bids us here meet today in solemn council our several pretensions to compose. The king! God save the king! Oh, oh royal sir, God save your majesty. Rise, both of you. Rise to my arms, Astolfo and Estrella. As my two sisters' children, always mine, now more than ever, since myself and Poland solely to you for our succession looked. And now give ear, you and your several factions, and you the peers and princes of this realm, while I reveal the purport of this meeting. You and the world, who have surnamed me Sage, know that I owe that title, if my due. To my long meditation on the book, which ever lying open overhead, the book of heaven, I mean, so few have read. Oh, had the self-same heaven upon its page inscribed my death, ere I should read my life, and by forecasting of my own mischance, play not the victim, but the suicide in my own tragedy. But you shall hear. You know how once, as kings must for their people, I wooed and wedded. Know, too, that my queen in childing died, but not as you believed with her, the son she died in giving life to. For as the hour of birth was on the stroke, heaven's two champions, sun and moon, I mean, suffused in blood upon each other fell in such a raging duel of eclipse as hath not terrified the universe since that which wept in blood, the death of Christ. When the dead walked, the waters turned to blood, earth and her city stuttered, and the world seemed shaken to its lost paralysis. In such a paroxysm of dissolution, that son of mine was born. By that first act, I found written in his horoscope, as great a monster in man's history as was in nature his nativity. I gave abroad that he had died with her. I had him carried to a lonely tower, hewn from the mountain barriers of the realm, and under strict anathema of death, guarded from men's inquisitive approach, save from the trusty few one needs must trust, but even this, not without grave misgiving lest by some chance misreading of the stars or misdirection of what rightly read, I wrong my son of his prerogative and Poland of her rightful sovereign. Well, thus perplexed, I have resolved at last to bring the thing to trial. Cotaldo, 
who guards my son with all fidelity, shall bring him hither from his tower by night, locked in a sleep, as fast as by my art I rivet to within the link of death, but yet from death so far, that next day's dawn shall wake him up upon the royal bed, complete in consciousness and faculty, when with all princely pomp and retinue, my loyal peers with due obeisance shall hail him Sigismund, the Prince of Poland. Then, if with any show of human kindness he fling discredit, not upon the stars, but upon me, their misinterpreter, with all apology mistaken age can make to youth, it never meant to harm. To my son's forehead will I ship the crown I long have wished upon a younger brow, and in religious humiliation, for what of worn-out age remains to me, entreat my pardon both of heaven and him for tempting destinies beyond my reach. But if, as I misdoubt at his first step, the hoof of the predicted savage shows, then shall I, having lost that heir direct, look solely to my sister's children twain, each of a claim so equal as divides the voice of Poland to their several sides. But as I trust to be entwined ere long into one single wreath so fair and strong, as shall at once all difference atone and cease the realm's division with their own. Such news, and from such lips, may well suspend the tongue of loyal answer most attuned. But if to me, as spokesman of my faction, your highness looks for answer, I reply for one and all, let Sigismund, whom now we first hear tell of as your living heir, appear, and but in your sufficient eye, approve himself worthy to be your son, then we will hail him Poland's rightful heir. What says my cousin? Aye, with all my heart. Oh, dear. I hoped and did expect of all, not less. And sure, no sovereign ever needed more from all who owe him love and loyalty. For if this coming trial justify my thus withholding from my son his right, is not the judge himself justified in the father's shame? And if the judge proved wrong, my son withholding from his right thus long, shame and remorse to judge and father both, Unless remorse and shame together drown in having what I flung for worthless found. But come, already weary with your travel and ill refreshed by this strange history, until the hours that draw the sun from heaven unite us at the customary board, each to his several chamber, you to rest, I to contrive with all Crotaldo best the method of a stranger thing than old time has as yet among his records told. And so we learn of the strange deed of King Basilio. But now, yielding to his conscience, the king has decided to give Sigismund a chance to join his fellow men and be his father's rightful heir. To this end, Basilio has caused Sigismund to be given so deep a potion that when he awakes, the terrible past shall seem to have been but a dream. We are again in the throne room. The potion has been administered, and the king has summoned Clotaldo to learn its effect. Tell me thus far how goes it. In due time, the potion left him... At the very hour to which your highness tempered it. Yet not so holy, but some lingering mist still hung about his dawning senses. Which to clear, we filled and handed him a morning drink, with sleep's specific antidotes suffused. And while with princely raiment we invested what nature surely modeled for a prince. All but the sword, as you directed. Aye. If not too loudly, yet emphatically still with the title of a prince, addressed him. How bore he that? With all the rest, my liege, I will not say so. Like one in a dream. So far, so well, Totaldo. Either way, the best of all, if toward the worst, I dread. But yet, uh, no violence? At most, impatience. 
Weary, perhaps, with importunities we yet were bound to offer. Oh, for Caldo, though thus far well, yet would myself have drunk. The potion he receives from such suspense crowds all the pulses of life's residue into the present moment. And I think whichever way the trembling scale may turn, we'll leave the crown of Poland for someone to wait no longer than the setting sun. Courage, my liege. The curtain is undrawn, and each must play his part out manfully, leaving the rest to heaven. Hark! 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 Was that his voice within? Now louder! Oh, Portfolio! What? So soon begun to roar? Until the moment we must hide. Father! I stifle your perfume! from wreck with its bewildered senses. What? This fantastic Sigismund the same, who last night, for all his nights before, lay down to sleep in wolf skin on the ground, in a black turret which the wolf howled round, and woke again upon a golden bed, round which as clouds upon a rising sun, in scarce less glittering comparison, gathered gay shapes that underneath a breeze of music handed him upon their knees, the wine of heaven in a cup of gold. And still, in soft, melodious undersong, hailing me prince of Poland, Segesman. They said, our prince, the prince of Poland. And again, oh, welcome. Welcome to his own. Our own prince, Segesman. Oh, but a blast. One blast of the rough mountain air. One look at the grim features. Prince Segesman, they called you. And at will, I shook them off. Will they return again at my command, again to call me so? Within there! You! Segesman called! Prince Segesman! I rejoice that unadvised of any but the voice of royal instinct in the blood, your highness has stained the chair that you were born to fill. The chair? The royal throne of Poland, sir, which may your royal highness keep as long as he that now rules from it shall have ruled when heaven has called him to itself. When he? Your royal father, King Basilio, sir. My royal father? King Basilio? You see, I answer but as Echo does, not knowing what she listens or repeats. This is my throne. This is my palace. Oh, but this out of the window. Warsaw, sir, your capital. And all those moving people. Your subject in thy capital. Warsaw. And I am prince of it. You see, it needs much iteration to strike sense into the human echo. Left a while in the quick brain, the word will quickly full meaning blow. You think so? But one thing for a moment in your ear. Do you know one Clotaldo? Oh, my lord, he and myself together, I may say, although in different vocations, have silvered in your royal father's service. And as I trust, with both of us a few white hairs to fall in your... Well said, well said. Basilio, my father. Well, Clotaldo. Is he my kinsman too? Oh, my good lord, a general simply in your highness' service. Than whom your highness has no trust here. Aye, so you said before, I think. And you with that white wand of yours. Oh, my good lord, you laugh at me. And I, right glad to make you laugh at such a price. You know me no enchanter. If I were, I and my wand as much to your highness as now your chamberlain. My chamberlain? And these that follow you? On you, my lord. Your Highness, Lords in Waiting. Lords in Waiting. Well, I have now learned to repeat, I think, if only but by rote. This is my palace. And this my throne, which unadvised. And that, out of the window there, my capital. And all the people moving up and down, my subjects and my vassals like yourselves. My Chamberlain and Lords in Waiting. And Clotaldo. 
And Clotaldo. You are an aged and seem a reverend man. You do not, though his fellow officer, you do not mean to mock me. Oh, my lord! Well, then, if no magician, as you say, yet setting me a riddle that my brain with all its senses whirling cannot solve, yourself or one of these with you must answer. How I, that only last night fell asleep, not knowing that the very soil of earth I lay down, chained to sleep upon, was Poland, awake to find myself the lord of it, with lords and generals and chamberlains, and even my very jailer for my vassal. Stand all aside. That I may put into his hand the clue to lead him out of this amazement. Sir, vouchsafe your highness from my bended knee. Receive my homage first. Clotaldo, what at last his old self? Undisguised for all his masquerade to end it, you kneeling to. What have the stars you told me long ago laid that old work upon you, added this, that having chained your prisoner so long, you loose his body now to slay his witch, dragging him, how I know not, whither scarce I understand, dressing him up in all this frippery with your dumb familiars despised and their lips unlocked to lie, calling him prince and king and madman-like, setting a crown of straw upon his head? Would but your highness, as indeed I now must call you, and upon this bended knee, but rest in the assurance of your own sane, waking senses by these witnesses attested, till the story of it all, of which I bring a chapter, be revealed. Assured of all you see and hear as neither madness nor mockery. What then? All, it seems. This palace with its royal garniture, this capital of which it is the eye, with all its temples, marts, and arsenals, this realm of which this city is the head, with all its cities, villages, and tilth, its armies, fleets, and commerce, all your own. All this is so. As sure as anything is or can be. You swear it on the faith you taught me elsewhere. Swear it upon this symbol and champion of the holy faith. I wear it to defend. Well, then, all this is thus. For have not these fine people told me so? And you, Clotaldo, sworn it. And the why and wherefore are to follow by and by. And yet, and yet, why wait for that which you who take your oath on it can answer? And indeed, it presses hard upon my brain. What I was asking of these gentlemen when you came in upon us. How is it that I, a Segismund you know so long, no longer than the sun that rose today, rose, and from what you know, rose to be prince of Poland? Oh, let your highness draw the line across forewritten sorrow. And in this new dawn, bury that long, sad night. Not even the dead, called to the resurrection of the blessed, shall so directly drop all memory of woes and wrongs foregone. But not resent. Purge by the trial of that sorrow past for full fruition of their present bliss. Even from the very dawn of consciousness, down at the bottom of the barren rocks, where scarce a ray of sunshine found him out, in which the poorest beggar of my realm, at least to human full proportion, grows. Me, me, whose station was the kingdom's top to flourish in, reaching my head to heaven, and with my branches overshadowing the meaner growth below. Yourself, even more than any subject here, are bound by yet another and more strong allegiance, King Basilio, your father. Basilio, king, my father. Oh, my lord, let me beseech you on my bended knee. For your own sake, for Poland's, and for his, who, looking up for counsel to the skies, did what he did, under authority to which kings of earth themselves are subject. The king, my father, either I am mad already, or that way driving fast, or I should know that fathers do not use their children so. But mad or not, my hour is come, and I will have my reckoning. Either you lie under the skirt of sinless majesty, shrouding your treason... Or you shall pay the penalty by the same hand you owe it to. Why, my lord, forbear. What a young hand raised against silver hair. Stay. Stay. What, that boy. What, come and vanished as before. I scarce remember how, but... Welcome. Thrice welcome. Where is he? Why must I ask this twice? The page, my lord. I wonder at his boldness. Oh, but I tell you, he came with angel written in his face, as now it is, when all was black as hell about. And none of you who now... He came, an angel-like, flung me a shining sword to cut my way through darkness. 
And again, angel-like, rest it from me in behalf of one whom I will spare for sparing him. But he must come and plead with that same voice that prayed for me in vain. He is gone for and shall attend your pleasure, sir. Meanwhile, will not your highness, as in courtesy, return your royal cousin's greeting? Who's Astolfo, Duke of Muscovy, my lord, saluted, and with gallant compliment welcomed you to your royal title. Oh, you knew of this then? Knew of what, my lord? That I was Prince of Poland all the while, and you my subject. Pardon me, my lord, but some few hours ago myself I learned your dignity. But knowing it, no more than when I knew it not, your subject. What then? Your Highness Chamberlain even now has told you. Astolfo, Duke of Muscovy, your father's sister's son, your cousin, sir, and who as such and in his own right prince, expects from you the courtesy he shows. His Highness is as yet unused to court and to the ceremonious interchange of compliment, especially to those who draw their blood from the same royal fountain. Where is the lad? I weary of all this. Prince, cousins, chamberlains, and compliments. Where are my soldiers? Throw the trumpet. And with one sharp blast, scatter these butterflies and bring them in a iron to my side, with whom a king feels like a king indeed. Welcome, my lord. Right welcome to the throne that much too long has waited for your coming. And in the general voice of Poland, you're a kinswoman and cousin, no less sincere. Aye, this is welcome, welcome worth indeed. And cousin, cousin worth. Oh, I have thus o'er the threshold of the mountain seen, leading a bevy of fair stars, the moon enter the court of heaven. My kinswoman, my cousin, but my subject. If you please to count your cousin for your subject, sir, you shall not find her disloyal. Oh, but there are twin stars in that heavenly face that now I know for having overruled those evil ones that darkened all my past. And brought me forth from that captivity to be the slave of her who set me free. Indeed, my lord. These eyes have no such power over the past or present. But perhaps they brighten at your welcome to supply the little that a lady's speech commends. And in the hope that, let whichever be the other's subject, we may both be friends. Your hand to that. But why does this warm hand shoot a cold shudder through me? In revenge for likening me to that cold moon, perhaps. Ah, but the lip whose music tells me so breathes of a warmer planet, and that lip shall remedy the treason of the hand. Release me, sir. And pardon me, my lord, this lady is a princess absolute, as prince he is, who just saluted you and claims her by a fire. Hence, old fool! Whatever thrusting that white stick of yours between me and my pleasure? This cause is mine. Forbear, sir. What, sir, mouthpiece? You again? My lord, I waive your insult to myself in recognition of the dignity you yet are new to. But for this lady, whom, if my cousin now, I hope to claim henceforth by yet a nearer, dearer name... What tell I? She's my cousin, too. And if you be a prince, well, am not I the lord of the very soil you stand upon? You call me Prince of Poland. And yourselves, my subjects. Traitors, therefore, to this very hour, who let me perish all my youth away, chained there among the mountains, till forsooth your spirit me up here, I know not how. Pop and Jay like invest me like yourselves, choke me with scent and music that I loathe, and worse than all, the music and the scent, with false, long winded, fulsome compliment, thwart me indeed at every step I take, the first who dares to meddle with me more. Princes and chamberlains and counselors, their eyes. Who dare? the lion. That is the king, my father. I have heard that sometimes blind instinct has been known to draw to mutual recognition those of the same blood, beyond all memory divided, or even never met before. I know not how this is, perhaps in brutes that live by kindlier instincts, but I know that looking now upon that head whose crown pronounces him a sovereign king, I feel no setting of the current in my blood toward him as sire. 
How is it with you, old man, toward him they call your son? Alas, alas. Your sorrow, then? Beholding what I do. Aye, but how know this sorrow that has grown and molded to this present shape of man as of your own creation? Even from birth. You are my father. And is it true, then, as Clotaldo swears, was you that from the dawning birth of one yourself brought into being? You, I say, who stole his very birthright, not alone that secondary and peculiar right of sovereignty, but even that prime inheritance that all men share alike, and chained him, chained him like a wild beast, whelp. Answer if this be thus. Oh, Sigismund, in all that I have done that seems to you unnatural and cruel, t'was not I, but one who writes his order in the sky. Oh, those stars. Those stars that too far up from human blame to clear themselves, or careless of the charge, still bear upon their shining shoulders all the guilt men shift upon them. Nay, but think, how should I thus deal with my innocent child, doubly desired and doubly dear when come, unless at that superior will, to which not kings alone, but sovereign nature bows. And what had those same stars to tell of me that should compel a father and a king so much against that double instinct? That which I have brought you hither at my peril against their written warning. To disprove by justice, mercy, human kindliness, that living, you might learn to live and rule yourself and Poland. By the means you took to spoil for either. All that is past, we shall look upon as the first outbling of a generous nature rioting in first liberty. And if this blossom do but promise such a flower as promises in turn its kindly fruit, forthwith upon your brow the royal crown that now weighs heavy on my aged brow. I will devolve, and while I pass away into some cloister with my maker there, to make my peace in penitence and prayer, happily settle the disordered realm that now cries loudly for a lineal heir. Boast not of giving up at last the power you can no longer hold, nor never rightly held, but in fee for him you robbed it from, and be assured your savage once let loose will not be caged again so quickly, not by threat nor adulation to be tamed, Till he have had his quarrel out with those who made him what he is. Beware, beware. Subdue the kindled tiger in your eye. Know that, if old, I yet have bigger left to wield the sword as well as wear the crown. That will I stake thy being to trial. Oh, after a revelation such as this, the last day shall have little left to show of righted wrong and villainy requited. Down with him, that I may trample on that false white head so long has worn my crown. Where are my soldiers? Of all my subjects and my vassals here, not one to do my bidding? Ha! Ah, a trumpet. The trumpet. Aye, indeed, the trumpet blows a memorable note to summons those who are forthwith you fall not at the feet of him whose head you threaten with the dust. Forthwith shall draw the curtain of the past about you and this momentary gleam of glory that you think to hold life fast. So coming, so shall vanish. As a dream. No! Traitors! Hold up! Unhand me! Am I not your king? And you would strangle me. But I am breaking with an inward fire shall scorch you up and wrap me on the wings of conflagration from a kindled pyre of lying prophecies and prophet kings above the extinguished stars. Reach me the sword he flung me. Fill me such a bowl of wine as that you woke the day... And shall close. But of the vintage, Protaldo knows. Basilio's experiment has failed. He feels that the savage in his son is untamable, and therefore the stars were right. Segismund is no fit man to rule. He does not realize that Segismund was only momentarily aroused by his sense of the injustice done to him, nor that his savagery was easily stilled by the sudden reappearance of Rosara, who so comforted him in the forest. So Segismund is returned to his former prison, and as before, he is given another potion to enable him to believe that his b brief moment of glory as royal heir was also only a dream, a nightmare. And to complete the illusion of a dream, Clotaldo, his guardian, is there to explain to Segismund when he awakens that he was talking in his sleep. Princes and princesses and counselors flustered to right and left. My life made that. 
even the white-haired venerable king seized on. Indeed, you made wild work of it, flinging your arms about you in your sleep, grinding your teeth, and, as I now remember, woke, mouthing out judgment and execution on those about you. I... I did indeed. Even now, your eyes stare wild, your hair stands up, your pulses throb and flutter, reeling still under the storm of such a dream. A dream that seemed as swearable reality as that I wake in now. I... Wondrous how imagination in a sleeping brain, out of the uncontingent senses, draws sensations strong as from the real touch. For you know, tis nothing but a dream. Nay, you yourself know best how lately you awoke from that you know you went to sleep on. Why, have you never dreamt the like before? Never to such reality. Last night, last night, oh, what a day was that between last night and this sad today. And I remember how the old man they called the king wore the crown of gold about his silver hair just when my rage was roaring at its height and after which it all was dark again. Bid me beware lest all should be a dream. Dreams are rough copies of the waking soul, yet uncorrected of the higher will. Take my advice. It is early yet, the sun scarce up above the mountain. Go within. If the night deceive a Jew, try anew with morning. Morning dreams, they say, come true. Or rather, pray for me asleep so fast as shall obliterate dream and waking too. Go sleep. Sleep fast. Sleep away those two night potions and the waking dream between. Yet, yet in these our ghostly lives, half night, half day, half sleeping, half awake, how of our waking life, like that of sleep, we all a dream in the eternal life to which we wake not till we sleep in death. And all this stage of earth in which we seem such busy actors and the parts we played substantial as the shadow of a shade. And dreaming, but a dream within a dream. I must forthwith to court to tell the king the issue of this lamentable day. Farewell. This is the frontier pass, at any rate, where Poland ends and Muscovy begins. We must be close upon the tower I know that halfway up the mountain lies in Scots. How knew you that? He told me so. The page who put us on the scent. And, as I think, will soon be here to run it down with us. Meantime, our horses on these ugly rocks, useless and worse than useless with their clatter, even behind with one or two in charge. And softly... Softly, softly. There it is. There what? The tower, the fortress. That the tower? That mousetrap. We can pitch it down the rocks with our own hands. The rocks it hangs among dwarf its proportions and conceal its strength. Larger and stronger than you think. No matter. No place for Poland's prince to be shot in. No, no, no. I tell you, wait. So those within give signal. Shame to wait with such a cause at stake. Look. The signal from the tower. Prince Segesman. Prince Segesman. All's well. Gotaldo safe secured? No, by ill luck, instead of coming in, as we had looked for, he sprang on horse at once and off at gallop. And to court, no doubt. A blunder that. And yet, perchance, a blunder that may work well. Within who side with us? No one and all, to the last man, persuaded or compelled. Enough. No moment to be lost. Though Clotaldo had no revolt to tell of in the tower, the capital will soon awake to ours, and the king's force come blazing after us. Where's the prince? Within. So fast asleep we woke him not. Even striking off the chains we had so cursedly helped bind him with, not knowing what we did. Come, we will bring him forth, out of that stony darkness. But air and sunshine sooner shall disperse the sleepy fume which they've drugged him with. Still, still so dead asleep. The very noise and motion that we make in carrying him stirs not a leaf in all the living tree. Come, let us all kneel round, and with a blast of warlike instruments and acclamation of all loyal hearts... Rouse and restore him to his royal right, from which no royal wrong shall drive him more. Again. So soon. What not yet done with me? The sun is little higher up, I think, than when I last lay down. Sir. And now, not in a palace, not in the fine clothes we all were in, but here in the old place and in our old accoutrements, 
Only your visor's off and lips unlocked to mock me with that idle title. Nay, indeed, no idle title, but your own. Then, now, and now forever. For behold, even as I speak, the mountain passes fill and bristle with the advancing soldiery that glitters in your rising glory, sir. And at our signal, echo to our cry, Segersman, King of Poland. <laughs> All this they said before to softer music. But Cocaldo, where is he? Fled, my lord. But close pursued, he fled before. And after he had sworn it on his knees, came back to take me where I am. No more, no more of this. Away with you. Be gone. You scare me from my little wits yet left. Be gone. I know I must be near awake, knowing I dream. Indeed, I do not wonder, sir. Your sense dazzle under practices which... Treason shrinking from its own device would now persuade you only was a dream. But waking was as absolute as this you wake in now. And uh, some who saw you then, prince as you were and are, can testify. Not only saw, but under false allegiance, laid hands upon I, to my shame. And I. Who to wipe out that shame have been the first to stir and lead us. Hark! Our forces, sir! Our forces, sir! Challenging King Basilio, now in sight and bearing down upon us. Sir, you hear? A little hesitation and delay and all is lost. Your own right and the lives of those who now maintain it at that cost. With you all is saved and won, without all lost. That former recognition of your right, grant but a dream if you will have it so. Great things for cast themselves by shadows, great. The prince! The prince! Who calls for him? The page who spurred us hither and now dismounted from a flaming horse. Oh, my lord, for the third time behold me here where first you saw me. By a happy misadventure losing my own way here... To find it out for you to follow with these loyal men, adding the moment of my little cause to yours, which by a strange chance runs hand in hand with mine. In spite of this attire, I am a woman, and of a noble stock I will not name till I who brought it have retrieved the shame. The Duke Astolfo, Prince of Muscovy, with all the solemn vows of wedlock, won me, and would have wedded as I do believe had not the cry of Poland for a prince called him from Muscovy to join the prize of Poland with a fair Estrella's eyes. I, following him hither, as you saw, was cast upon these rocks, arrested by Cotaldo, who for an old debt of love he owed my family with all his might served and had served me further till my cause clashed with his duty to his sovereign. He carried me to court, where for the second time I crossed your path, where, as I watched my opportunity... Suddenly broke this public passion out, which drowning private into public wrong, yet swifter sweeps it to revenge along. Oh, God, if this be dreaming, charge it not to burst the channel of enclosing sleep and drown the waking reason. If this be truth, and all of us awake, indeed a famous quarrel is at stake. If but a vision, I will see it out and drive the dream. I can but join the rout. And in good time, sir, for here is Clotaldo taken. Aye, Clotaldo indeed. What, back again, Clotaldo, for a while to swear me this for truth, and afterwards all for a dreaming lie? Awake or dreaming, down with that sword, and down these traitors' ears, draw in rebellion against their sovereign. Traitor, traitor yourself. But soft, soft, soft. You told me not so very long ago, awake or dreaming, I forget. My brain is not so clear about it. But I know one test you gave me to discern between which mad and dreaming people cannot master. Or if the dreamer could so best secure a comfortable waking. Was not so. Totaldo ruffled nurse and tutor too. That only traitor worked to me if true. Captain, give him his sword. Set him on a fresh horse. Conduct him safely through my rebel force, and so God speed him to his sovereign side. Give me your hand, and whether all awake or all are dreaming, ride, Clotaldo, ride. Dream swift, for fear we dream should overtake. Segusman knows now that he was not dreaming. Upheld by an army of supporters, conscious of his full sovereignty, refraining from violence, he has sent Clotaldo back to Basilio knowing that Basilio will accept this as a challenge and lead an army against him. An open contest between father and son follows. It is a long and bitter battle, and Basilio discovers that his son has proven himself a worthy foe. Now the battle is over, and we 
we are in the field with the king and his advisors. The day is lost. Do not despair. Take horse into the capital, Malige. We're in some safe and holy sanctuary. Save Poland in your person. Be persuaded. You know your son. Have tasted of his temper. Aye, how he fought. Oh, how he fought a stalpo. Ranks of men falling as swaths of grass before the moor. I could but pause to gaze at him and pray Poland had such a warrior for a king. Where is the king? Behold him. Thus underneath your feet his golden crown and the white head that wears it laying down his fond resistance hope to expiate. Princes and warriors of Poland, you that stare on this unnatural sight aghast, listen to one who heaven inspired to do what in its secret wisdom heaven forecast. By that same heaven instructed prophet wise to justify the present in the past. Witness now this venerable age. Christ crowned a sire and sovereign and sage, down to the very dust dishonored by the very means he tempted to defy, the irresistible. And shall not I, till now the mere dumb instrument that wrought the battle fate has with my father fought, now the mere mouthpiece of its victory, oh, shall not I, the champion sword laid down, be yet more ashamed to wear the teacher's gown. Oh, Sigismund, in whom I see out of the ashes of my self-extinction a better self revive. If not beneath your feet, beneath your better wisdom bowed, the sovereignty of Poland I resign with this, its golden symbol. For what remains? As for my own, so for my people's peace. Astolfo's and Estella's plight hands I disunite, and taking hers to mine, his, to one yet more dearly his, resign. You, Clotaldo, that with unflinching duty to your king, till countermanded by a mightier power, have held your prince a captive in the tower, henceforth as strictly guard him on the throne, no less my people's keeper than my own. You stare upon me all amazed to hear the word of civil justice from such lips as never yet seemed tuned to such discourse. But listen, in that same enchanted tower, not long ago, I learned it from a dream. How dreamwise human glories come and go, whose momentary tenure not to break, walking as one who knows he soon may wake, so fairly carry the full cup so well disordered insolence and passion quell that there be nothing after to upbraid, dreamer or doer, in the part he played. Whether tomorrow's dawn shall break the spell or the last trumpet of the eternal day, when dreaming with the night shall pass away. Which is dream and which is reality <clears throat> does not <clears throat> matter greatly. Both have their parts to play in the lives of men. Both have taught Sigismund the necessary wisdom in the ruling of men. The play today was directed by James Church, and the players were cast as follows. Basilio Winfield Honey. Sigismund Carl Benton Reed. Rosara Beatrice Miller. Fife Mark Smith. Cotaldo Charles Webster. Astolfo Burford Hamden. Estrella Catherine Squire. Captain Lowell Gilmore. Soldiers, Paul Porter, James Mitchell, Philip Foster. Chamberlain, Harry Mester, and the Lord, Sidney Cassell. The orchestra was under the, the direction of Joseph Hunty. Next week at the same time, we shall be back in France with that happy playwright comedian, Jean-Baptiste Poquelin, whom the world knows as the great Molière. The play will be his comedy, the bourgeois gentilhomme, or to you and me, the would-be gentleman. Till then, as we say in Spain, adios. The Great Place series is an educational feature of the National Broadcasting Company. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York.